our guest right now is Professor Lewis Michael Seidman, the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Constitutional Law at Georgetown Law. He's also been a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, the University of Chicago Law School, NYU Law School, <clears throat> and the University of Virginia Law School. He teaches a variety of courses in the fields of constitutional and criminal law, and he has a new book coming out um, this month, From Parchment to Dust, The Case for Constitutional Skepticism. Uh, we have Professor Seidman um, to talk about the Supreme Court and some of the, the overarching trends that you should be aware of uh, as for, for reporters who are covering the court and for those who are you know, covering the political process around the court. So Professor, I wanna thank you very much. I apologize, or thank you for your flexibility and letting us start a little bit late so we can get that last session wrapped up. We will, we will be with him until 11 o'clock and he has some comments and then we'll have time for questions. So Professor, thank you very much. Well, well thank you, Chris, and, and uh, thanks to everybody for coming. It's just a, really a pleasure to be here, even if only on uh, Zoom, only electronically. Uh, so as Chris indicated, I'm gonna talk about three things. First, um, the long-term direction that the court is likely to take. Uh, second, how things are likely to play out in the shorter term, specifically this year. And then third, I'm going to say some, uh, I'm afraid, kind of ill-tempered things about both how the court is covered and about the, the Supreme Court itself. Uh, but before I get to any of that, I, I do want to warn you that my views about these subjects are uh, controversial and, uh, shall we say, there's not, they're not universally shared. And so I do want to uh, leave some time so that we can have a uh, discussion about all this. Okay, so the long-term trends for reason that I think everybody knows, um, the Supreme Court is the most conservative court, uh, Supreme Court in at least a century, and it's likely to remain that way for the foreseeable future. That pretends uh, some major changes in constitutional law. Uh, the real questions are just how major will they be and what the reaction to those changes is likely to be. So there are obvious areas where it seems inevitable that there will be movement to the right. Uh, Roe v. Wade hangs by a thread. The court, the court is certain to move more forcefully to protect organized religion its prior precedent concerning affirmative action is in serious jeopardy. Uh, but there are also some less obvious areas that we're watching. So first, even before the new appointments, the court has been the most uh, pro-business in recent memory. That trend is certain to continue with decisions further restricting consumer rights, limits, uh, restricting limits on advertising, restricting antitrust enforcement and labor rights, and restricting environmental enforcement. Uh, the court is also, I think, likely to continue to use uh, the First Amendment free speech clause as a deregulatory tool. Uh, second, in a related area, um, uh, there are likely to be judicial efforts to roll back the regulatory state. We're likely to see the court using the Administrative Procedure Act to invalidate regulations that it views as arbitrary and capricious or where the agency has failed to cut square procedural concerns. The court is likely to cut back on, on doctrines giving deference to agency discretion. Perhaps most dramatically, the court seems poised to revive the so-called anti-delegation doctrine, which had long been thought to be a dead letter. Uh, that's a doctrine that says that Congress cannot delegate legislative decision-making to executive branch agencies. It was used a couple of times during the New Deal period, almost a century ago to invalidate some of President Roosevelt's programs, but it's been dormant ever since. Uh, there are already five justices who've sig signaled that they want to revive the doctrine. The question is, that's still open is how forceful uh, that revival is likely to be. Third, the court is also likely to continue the recent trends toward a narrower reading of Congress's Commerce Clause and spending powers. 
With regard to the Commerce Clause, it's easy to imagine the court striking down more federal statutes on the ground that the Constitution leaves the matter to the states. To give uh, one example, there's no obvious connection between uh, the Endangered Species Act and interstate commerce. Uh, with regard to the Spending Clause, many federal statutes don't directly require enforcement of federal power uh, federal policy, but instead condition federal spending on adherence to what Congress dictates. Uh, the court famously restricted this power uh, in the first Affordable Care Act case, where it held that Congress had exceeded its powers by conditioning Medicaid funding on extending Obamacare protection. I think we're likely to see more decisions along similar lines. A uh, fourth, uh, I think that familiar criminal justice holdings are at risk. Uh, both the Fourth Amendment exclusionary rule and the requirements of Miranda versus Arizona have already been substantially defanged, but we might see more movements in that direction. And then finally, and perhaps most consequentially, we have to wonder what the court's reaction will be if we have a new con renewed controversy over the 2022 and 24 elections. Uh, for the most part, the court stayed out of things in 2020, but it may not have that luxury in the future. The fate of American democracy may hang in the balance when it decides whether to in intervene in the next elections, and if it does intervene on which side. Um, with regard to all these matters, the conservative justices have a choice. They can adjust things at the margin. They can dramatically change things in a few areas, but not do much in other areas. Or they could embark across the board on an authentic constitutional revolution. Meanwhile, they have to at least glance over their shoulder at the political effects of their decision. Uh, as many of you probably know, Gallup approval ratings for the court are at a new all-time low, and the president has appointed a commission to study various proposals to reform the court and restrict its powers. I don't think the Supreme Court is in immediate danger. For it to be in danger, two things would have to happen. It would have to issue new dramatic decisions that, for example, held unconstitutional big portions of President Biden's agenda. And the Dem Democrats would have to have big wins in congressional elections. Uh, neither of those prospects is on the immediate horizon, but both could conceivably happen. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts is acutely aware of these risks, but he's not in full command of his own troops. How are those trends going to play out in the short run in the cases that the court will hear this term? Well, it has two big cases on its docket concerning abortion and guns, with the possibility of a third concerning affirmative action. Uh, first, abortion. Most of the press attention has been on the Texas heartbeat bill, but much more important is the case that is actually before the court involving Mississippi's 15 week limit on abortions. The court could conceivably do one of four things here. First, it could simply reaffirm Rose Wade, Roe versus Wade's ban on pre-viability restrictions on abortion and strike down the law. Second, it could overrule Roe outright and say that the Constitution has nothing to say about abortion. Third, it could, afford, it could affirm the 15-week ban and leave it at that and say really nothing about whether uh, further restrictions, say California's six-week ban, are permissible. And then finally, it could reaffirm Roe and the later Supreme Court case, uh, the Casey case, which says that regulations cannot unduly restrict abortions, and it could hold, but it could hold that the Mississippi ban does not unduly restrict abortion. And in that regard, it may be relevant that something like 90% of abortions, in fact, occur within the first 15 weeks. So which of those options is it going to choose? 
Of the possibilities, I think that number one is least likely. There was a clear majority of the court that is hostile to Roe versus Wade. So I don't think it's just going to reaffirm Roe and strike down the Mississippi law. My guess is that Chief Justice Roberts would prefer option four. That is reaffirming Roe, but holding that the Mississippi ban is not an undue burden and therefore upholding it. A holding like that uh, would diffuse the controversy over the Texas law and al allow the court to paint itself as reaching a kind of statesmanlike comp uh, compromise. Um, um, so that's a possibility. There will certainly be votes on the court for the second proposition, that is to say, overruling Roe entirely. I doubt that that will command a majority of the court, but it's possible it might. It seems more likely than that outcome that the justice will, justices will compromise themselves uh, between themselves or among themselves by choosing option three. That is upholding the Mississippi ban, but uh, saying really nothing about whether it would uphold more restrictive bans than Mississippi's. So we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, the other case involving guns is much easier to predict. At stake here is a New York statute that is a practical matter, makes it difficult or impossible for individuals to carry drug guns outside of their home. Uh, as most of you know, in 2008, the court decided the Heller case, which overturned a long held understanding that the second amendment was a dead letter and the court struck down a DC ordinance that prohibited possession of guns in a private home. The decision, the, that decision was certainly groundbreaking, but it was also quite limited. The court acknowledged that some sorts of gun regulation remain permissible, for example, limits on guns in sensitive public places or bans on certain kinds of guns. And it left for another day discussion of other sorts of uh, restrictions. In the years since Heller, the court has assiduously avoided further discussion of the limits of, of the kinds of limits that Heller permits. Uh, increasingly, though, the conservatives on the court have grown restive and have complained that the court has not gone further. Uh, now these conservatives have a super majority, and it seems certain that they will use their power to strike down the New York statute. The only real mystery is how far they will go. Will they uh, strike it down in a way that allows more narrowly limited um, restrictions on public carry, or will they broadly invalidate all such restrictions? The third issue that might or might not come before the court this term is affirmative action. Uh, there were now six justices on the court who are very hostile to affirmative action. And over the longer run, I think it is close to certain that the court will further restrict some programs and perhaps outlaw them altogether. Uh, there's now pending before the court a request that it hear a case involving the Harvard College Affirmative Action Program. My strong guess is that the Chief Justice uh, is not eager to hear the case this term. He doesn't want the court dealing with abortion, guns, and affirmative action all in the same term, perhaps even all on the same day. But under the court's rules, it takes only four justices to grant review. And again, he's not um, fully in control of his own troops. So we're just gonna have to see once again what happens. Okay, finally, I wanna say something um, that relates to your job, that is to say, covering the Supreme Court. And the bottom line is, I, I think the media is way, way too deferential to the court and is responsible for perpetrating myths about the court that in my judgment are harmful to public understanding of what's actually going on. The central myth, is that the court is composed of hardworking, wise, and very smart patriots who transcend politics 
and are doing their level best to do what the law requires. Uh, as Chief Justice Roberts famously said, uh, we do not have Obama judges or Trump judges, Bush judges or Clinton judges. What we have is an extraordinary group of dedicated judges doing their level best to do equal right to those appearing before them. So there's not much I agree with uh, the former guy about, but in this case, uh, he was absolutely right when he responded that of course there were Obama judges and Trump judges. How could it be otherwise when they're appointed and confirmed in proceedings that are drenched with raw partisanship? Uh, but the problem goes beyond the obvious political character of Supreme Court decisions, which I think actually the media does a reasonably good job recognizing. Um, so here's, for starters, unlike virtually everybody that I know, the justices, um, uh, well, for starters, there's the myth about the justices being hardworking. Uh, unlike virtually everybody I know, the justices, every year they get a three-month vacation. Uh, the number of cases they've decided has dropped from about 160 a generation ago to about 70 now. By my calculation, each justice writes about 220 pages in a year's work. Uh, that's far less than most of you write. And unlike hardworking journalists, they have lots of help. They get briefs that do most of the research for them and outline the arguments that they adopt. They have a bevy of librarians who cater to their every need. And most important, they have four very smart and eager and hardworking law clerks who ghostwrite many of the opinions for them. So the truth of the matter is, it's a very cushy job. Now, I don't doubt justices have above average IQs. They all have distinguished academic records. But you know what? They're not geniuses. And there are lots of things they know nothing about. Um, none of the justices has had to meet a payroll or make decisions outside of a huge bureaucracy. None is run for elective office. Although criminal cases are overrepresented on the court's docket, no sitting justice has ever served as a defense attorney. The justices regularly decide technical and complex cases about specialized matters like patent law and employee benefit law, but no sitting justice has devoted a significant amount of time to studying those matters. The court's opinions routinely rely on empirical assumptions, but the justices appear to be woefully ignorant of statistical method. Most of them have little or no background in the social sciences, much less in philosophy, literature, or the high science, uh, or the uh, hard sciences. Because no one has the power to say no to the justices, their opinions are often full of sloppy reasoning and mischaracterization of the record and occasionally outright falsehood. And there the press is really falling down. No one in the press regularly points this fact out. There is not fact checking like there is for political figures. On top of all that, throughout most of our history, and only with a very few exceptions, the Supreme Court has represented the most reactionary, regressive forces in our society. That might be okay if the justices were simply enforcing clear constitutional text, but they're not. Instead, they are interpreting sweeply and deeply ambiguous phrases like privileges and immunities of citizens, due process of law or equal protection, phrases that just can't be given meaning without importing into them value judgments, often value judgments that clear majorities of the American people do not share. The justices try to hide all this by insisting on a veil of secrecy over their deliberations and by quasi-religious quasi imagery with robes, elaborate ceremonies and all the your honors and standing up when they enter the room. The press just should not put up with any of this. In a democratic republic, respect for public officials should always be earned and always be held provisionally and never accorded just because of someone's title. At least it's presently constitution, 
the constituted, I don't think the Supreme Court deserves our respect. And I think journalists have an obligation to point that out. And with <laughs> those mild comments, I will, uh, I'm glad to uh, have a discussion with you guys. We'll go to Joey first. Yeah, hey, thanks for uh, uh, for the talk there. I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on uh, Justice Alito's criticism of the shadow dockets recently. And, you know, I guess he's he, he's been arguing that the media is, is misportrayed uh, and maybe sensationalized the use of that by the court. And just wanted to hear first just generally what your thoughts are about, uh, you, you know, what he in, in, in the uh, in the news said last week on uh, on shadow dockets. Uh, thank you, Joey. So um, for those of you who don't know what the shadow docket is, uh, the court regularly uh, hears and decides uh, what to do about emergency motions temporarily um, uh, staying uh, decisions below. Um, it's done that uh, for many years, but um, it, it's in, in the last several years, it's been doing much more of it. And this goes on uh, without full briefing and argument, often with um, often in a very hurried way. Um, so I'm, I'm very critical of the court, but I think in some ways the criticism of the shadow docket is um, not the right place to focus one's criticism on. And the reason for that is I'm skeptical that uh, in, in high profile cases, the briefs and the arguments and all of all of that stuff make much of a difference anyway. Um, the court, the justices, you know, on something like affirmative action or or uh, uh, religion, the guns, the, the justices pretty much know how they're going to vote and it's pretty predictable um, how they will vote. Um, so I'm not sure how much of a difference it makes. In some ways, what's more interesting than, uh, than the shadow docket is uh, the fact that so many of the justices have felt called upon to make public statements recently. It used to be that the justices almost never did that. And the fact that they're doing it, I think, suggests that uh, they're feeling some heat. Um, and in my judgment, that's a good thing. They deserve the heat that they're feeling. Thank you. Okay, any other fellow questions? Um, uh, Oma. Hi, thank you for being here, Professor. Um, I wanted to ask uh, more on what you just mentioned um, because the justices, like a handful of them at least, have spoken publicly recently, you know, defending uh, the court. Um, and we've seen some low public approval ratings come out. Uh, can you maybe, you know, shed some light on why we're seeing these these lower public approval ratings, maybe some reasons to it of why the public is viewing the court in this um, in a more negative way? So um, thank you for the question, Oma. Uh, um, in, in some ways, what's puzzling to me is not that their uh, uh, opinion rating is going down, but that it's taken so long. I mean, um, and, and I don't think it's much of a mystery why it's going down. So um, first of all, um, the, the people who disapprove of the court are divided between people who think it's too conservative and too liberal. Um, the, the court has long been in trouble with uh, conservatives about um, uh, things like, 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 like uh, gay marriage, for example. Uh, what's new is the growing disillusionment, and, and I th again, I think it's about time on the part of liberals. And so you have the, uh, you know, the, 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 the disgrace of what McConnell did with, with the, the Garland nomination. You have the total train wreck of the Kavanaugh um, uh, confirmation hearings, and then you have the uh, what the, the court's done recently in uh, the Texas abortion cases. So th there's more than enough cause for um, the numbers to go down. What, what's disturbing to me is that even after they have gone down, um, the uh, court standing is still higher than that of either Congress or the president. 
president. And that to me suggests something disturbing about the American people, a, a kind of a deep distrust in democratic institutions and a desire to somehow settle the things that divide us uh, in a kind of immaculate fashion without actually having to engage in politics. And in, in that regard, what's, what's really striking, the, the, the most admired institution in the United States, that what wins the sweepstakes is the military. And so um, if, if you range institutions uh, in terms of the extent to which they're politically accountable, uh, or, or the extent to which um, they, 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 they encourage debate and, um, and the kind of things that ought to go on in a democratic republic. You have the most democratic Congress at the bottom, followed by a slightly less democratic, the presidency, followed by the courts, followed by the military, which after all is all about just obeying orders and shut up and obey. And that's, I, I think that's disturbing about where the future of our country is going. Thank you. Okay, and um, Nate's up next and, and tell the professor uh, uh, where you're from when you ask your question. Hi, Professor. Uh, Nathaniel Reed, congressional reporter for uh, Newsy and EW Scripps. Uh, just a question for you regarding um, vacancies in the court. Uh, I know McConnell made comments that were kind of swirling back through the news recently, somewhat in line with his previous comments, just that he would leave a spot open on the court, potentially for an entire um, uh, congressional term of two years, uh, if Republicans were to win a majority in the Senate. I mean, is there any is there any recourse that you know Democrats could take at that point, or Biden could take, other than, I mean, the advocacy we saw, you know, with Obama, I guess creating a Twitter account for you know the SCOTUS nominee and just you know having Democrats meet with the nominee and calling it you know unconstitutional. I mean, is there anything? That can reasonably be done if there's a full two-year period that a you know a spot is open on the court. Well, uh, Mitch McConnell is single-minded and determined, and he's shown already how much you can do if you're really uh, prepared to to uh, use your power in a, in a in a ruthless way. If 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 the Republicans gain a uh, majority of the Senate, I don't think there's anything that can be done. Um, if they don't gain a majority of the Senate, um, then um, the, the, the filibuster rule has been abolished by for Supreme Court justices. And assuming that uh, Biden can hold all 50 Democrats, um, uh, he, he, he'll be able to nominate someone and, uh, he, and may, maybe even peel off some uh, Republican votes. In, in the longer term, I think there's a pressing need for uh, various reforms on the Supreme Court. Um, but as I said in, in a few minutes ago, I don't think that's likely unless um, uh, a lot more Democratic senators are, are elected and, 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 and the court does some really foolish things. Great, thank you. All right, I could, um, if, if any fellows have a question, throw, uh, throw your hands up. Um, I got a couple of questions. I wanna kind of follow up on what Oma was asking and that's kind of getting at the issue of the public's view of the court and the legitimacy that they give the court. Have there been periods of time in US history in which the court's public standing you know, dropped as it has, you know, these current polls show that it has, does that really have, a, does that have an impact on how they behave, on how the court behaves? Um, and if so, when has that happened in history? I believe Gallup has been asking this question only since 1970. So I don't think we have polls that go back further than that. But, but yes, there have been dramatic instances in which the court has lost legitimacy and where it's had an effect. So I'll just mention three times in American history, perhaps, well, three of the most dramatic times. First, when the court decided the Dred Scott case, that led to the formation of a political party, essentially. The, uh, the Republican Party, uh, part of its platform was um, 
to, to get rid of Dred Scott. And, and Lincoln, when he ran for office, famously said that um, it was enforceable with regard to uh, that case, but he wasn't going to enforce it um, otherwise. And ultimately, it, Dred Scott was overruled after 700,000 deaths um, and a civil war. Um, uh, secondly, during the uh, New Deal period, um, there was the, 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 the justices struck down several of Roosevelt's uh, New Deal proposals, and they seem poised to strike down um, many others. Uh, Roosevelt um, acted, reacted with fury, and after he won a overwhelming re-election, uh, uh, overwhelming victory in the off-term elections in 1938, he announced plans to uh, pack the court. He would have added seven additional justices, all of which presumably would have uh, uh, supported the New Deal. Um, ultimately, that plan was uh, defeated. It was uh, Roosevelt's first big loss and portended a decline in his political power that really lasted until uh, uh, World War II was declared. But uh, the, the, the cliche is he, he lost the battle but won the war. Um, um, a couple of things happened. First, um, uh, there's debate to this day about whether it was because of the court packing plan, but the justices began to uh, back down. And Justice Roberts uh, uh, changed his vote in a case about the minimum wage uh, this was uh, press people at the time called it uh, the change in time that saved nine. Um, and then um, Roosevelt finally uh, began to get some appointments. He'd got no appointments during his first term. He ultimately appointed all nine of the justices and there was a, a constitutional revolution. Um, and then the third occasion uh, where there was uh, a lot of controversy about the court was during the Warren period. Uh, in particular, the school prayer decisions, the desegregation decisions, and the, the uh, reapportionment decisions ignited a firestorm. Um, there were impeach Warren posters along many highways. Um, and it did have an impact on the court. Um, most famously, uh, shortly after Brown was decided, the court was faced with a decision about whether to invalidate a, uh, a statute that prohibited, in, prohibited interracial marriage. And we now know because of the justices um, conference notes, which are now public, that the court in an essentially lawless fashion um, rejected that lawsuit because they were worried about, um, about popular reaction. Um, Richard Nixon ran against the court in 1968 and uh, he ended up uh, getting four appointments to the court um, and began the uh, slow moving uh, conservative counter revolution which really culminated in the Trump period. What's your view on the, uh, I guess, the constitutional standing of whether additional members can be added to the court? And can you give us a little sense of how the court's numbers have changed, you know, since, since uh, um, 1787? There are a lot of proposals to reform the court, some of which are constitutionally questionable, but this is not one of them. Um, the, the, the Constitution uh, specifies that there shall be a Supreme Court of the United States, but it doesn't specify uh, the number of justices. And over the course of our history, the number has uh, ranged from, uh, I think, four uh, to 10. Uh, the shifts have, there have been a number of different reasons why the numbers have changed, but part of it has been uh, unhappiness with the justices. So this is, um, as a constitutional matter, it's, it's um, I don't think there's much controversy about it. What, what I think is interesting is uh, my, my own view is that what, what really holds the country together is not so much the constitution or not so much formal constitutional law, but a series of sub-constitutional kind of constraints and inhibitions 
and a, and a sense that of kind of mutuality that we don't do this when we're in power because we don't want the other side to do it when they're in power. And those are really eroding. And this is um, on, on both sides. And this is an example of that. Uh, there's no, no constitutional obstacle, but it, 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 the number has been fixed for uh, 150 years. Uh, and the fact that people are now seriously thinking about changing the number is one of many, many signs that the country is coming apart at the seams. Just so we have time for a couple more questions, um, I'll defer to, defer to somebody else if you have a question, otherwise I have a few more. Um, the, first of all, you, know, you were talking about those hardworking, smart uh, law clerks. You were, you were one of those uh, back for- uh, just so hardworking and not so smart, but I was okay. a law clerk, yes. Um, so you were, you were uh, what, what years that was that in the- 72, 73. That's uh, by the way, 1872 to 73. <laughs> okay. So, well, tell me a little bit about the, the big drop in cases. I think you said it was from 160 a term to 70 a term. Yeah. What is the, you know, what is the stated rationale for that big drop in productivity? Are they saying we're taking, we're only doing 70 cases, but they are more complicated cases? Or, is, or do they offer up an explanation for that? So, you know, um, being a Supreme Court justice means never having to say you're sorry and never having to give an explanation for what you do. So there is no explanation. Uh, I mean, there are there is uh, speculation by people like me, um, but, but the court, to my knowledge, no justice has ever explained why they've, they've done this. Um, one of the possible explanations, and this, this goes more to the this, this stuff about the justice is doing their own work. So it used to be uh, the justices pretty much decided which cases they were going to hear. Um, uh, they, they, the, the, uh, uh, when I was a law clerk, and it's still true, every week there would be hundreds of cert petitions, certiorari petitions, rolled into the justices' chambers, and the justices would have to go through them and decide which to grant and which not to grant. That job has almost entirely been turned over to what's called the cert pool. Uh, that is to say, um, uh, just uh, clerks of the justices uh, jointly, uh, they, they rotate and uh, it's a, the job of a few clerks to read all these and make recommendations to the justices. The justices almost follow the recommendations. Okay, so now I, if you think of, for a moment about the incentives that law clerks have when they read these things, um, if they, if they uh, decide to recommend denying certiorari, the case goes away and nobody ever hears of it again. And so if they make a mistake in denying cert, uh, they, they bear no consequences. If, if they recommend granting cert and the court grants cert and then it turns out that was a mistake or a bad thing to do, now it's a mess because they have to um, get rid of it somehow and the law clerk gets blamed. So it's no surprise law clerks are very gun shy about uh, voting to grant certiorari. So that's one reason. Uh, there may be others, but the court certainly hasn't told us what they are. Okay, and final question for me, are there any um, important First Amendment <clears throat> or press access or press freedom cases coming up in the court this year? Uh, anything that we need to be aware of from the media's perspective? That's a good question, and I, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer. I, 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 I haven't looked at um, all the, uh, the, the, the court's full docket for this year, I don't think they have any press cases on the docket. Um, there are two things in the longer term to look for. Uh, one is a number of the justices have expressed dissatisfaction with New York Times v. Sullivan. And so it is possible down the road that that may be changed or even gotten rid of entirely. Uh, the other is, as everybody here knows, there's tremendous um, uh, controversy about Facebook and social media. Um, and I could imagine um, uh, 
uh, Congress enacting regulations about that and, and that coming before the court. All right, well, those are the questions for me. Fellows, any, any final questions from you? All right, so Professor Seidman, I wanna thank you very much for taking the time to come talk with us. Um, fellows, uh, we will take a 10 minute break. Our, our next panel is four Supreme Court reporters. They'll start at 11 and uh, we will take them until the end of the morning at 12. But Professor, I wanna thank you very much, time, very much for, your, for your time and insights. Thanks and, for uh, inviting me, Chris. It was a lot of fun.